Thank you. This is uh, Dr. Steve Bartels, and I'm uh, delighted to welcome those of you on this webinar to the third webinar in the Older Americans Technical Assistance Center webinar series. If you've been on these uh, webinars before, I'm sure you know that the Older Americans Technical Assistance Center, the partnership between SAMHSA and the Institute on Aging, uh, with the goal of providing technical assistance to behavioral health programs for older adults. Specifically, uh, for this uh, initiative uh, sponsored by SAMHSA and OA, focused on suicide prevention, <laughs> drug misuse and abuse, uh, alcohol abuse, and anxiety and depression. I'll ask those of you who um, are listening, want to mute your phones um, if you uh, uh, have extraneous noise behind you. The initiative is uh, for the initiative. It's targeted for people at 60 years of older who experience behavioral health problems and specifically is focused on helping uh, all of us to better implement and enhance behavior programs and services on suicide prevention, prescription drug misuse and abuse, alcohol misuse and abuse, and anxiety and depression. So the way that these webinars are structured is that there will be 10 webinars offered to grantees that have been funded as well as uh, the large Aging Service Network and Behavioral Health Community. The particular one that we'll be doing today is focusing on on discussing risk factors for suicide, schools for suicide risk, effective prevention interventions, and also information about suicide prevention resources available from available from SAMHSA, the elder community, and a network of community agencies. So if you'll be hearing about uh, these resources, you'll be hearing about screening approaches and interventions, and you'll also be hearing some examples from some community agencies that will describe their experience to date implementing in-home mental health and substance abuse prevention and early intervention programs. To let you know also, the webinar will be recorded. Uh, the recording and slides will be provided to everyone who's registered after the webinar, so you can have to take notes. You'll have access to these uh, thereafter. Uh, and this webinar, just to give you a pre-date, uh, is uh, on depression, anxiety, and suicide prevention. will be held on April 18th from 2.30 to 4 o'clock Eastern uh, Standard Time. Uh, and all who are registered for this webinar will be given a reminder and webinar uh, registration. So just to give you a sense of the overview, we'll first have an initial presentation uh, focusing on uh, suicide screening uh, and intervention. Uh, that will be from 2 to 2.45, followed by a uh, second presentation uh, focusing on, uh, on uh, uh, examples around uh, some uh, resources that are available nationally. And then finally, uh, three speakers will talk about their experiences uh, implementing these types of programs in the community. So I think it's really a terrific overview from different perspectives for you. Um, I'm delighted to first uh, Present to you our first speaker, who's uh, Dr. Kim Van Orden, uh, who is a colleague of Yates Conwell, who's coordinated this presentation uh, today. Unfortunately, Dr. Conwell was going to present, but the two of them have put together this presentation because Dr. Conwell is, uh, is occupied with some health uh, issues right now. Uh, we'll be back in uh, in, the, uh, in uh, gear uh, uh, shortly. Uh, but uh, Dr. Orden has been gracious and. And, and partnering with him and putting together this presentation. She uh, received her PhD in clinical psychology from Florida State University, did a doctoral internship at Montefiore Medical Center, and is finishing an NIH-sponsored uh, postdoctoral fellowship in suicide prevention along with Dr. Conwell at uh, University of Rochester Medical Center. She has special research interests in the etiology and prevention of late-life suicide, and particularly is interested in the role of social connectedness a protective factor and a tool for prevention. She's an investigator on a CDC, Center for Disease Control funded trial, examining the mental health benefits of peer companionship and has co-authored numerous uh, scientific papers on suicide prevention uh, and a co-author on, on a group, uh, on a book, on a personal theory of suicide. So it's a privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Orden who will uh, start the opening remarks on uh, on suicide in older adults, who's at risk, and what can we do about it? Gordon? Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I'm very happy to get to be here with all of you today. 
um, and excited for the discussion that we'll have um, at the end and hear some more perhaps about the neat projects that you are doing on suicide prevention. Um, as, as Steve mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the epidemiology of, of late life suicide, so who is at risk, and then how we can use the, what we know about who is at risk to uh, talk about screening and prevention. What we have up here, just that we don't have any uh, conflicts of it, uh, but Yates and I have many, many collaborators who have helped us in this work um, that I'm going to be putting uh, on for you here today, so we want to acknowledge them. And look at the next slide. And to start us out, because Yates and I are in Rochester, New York, um, we'd like to start with an example of uh, George Eastman, who um, is the founder of, of Kodak, as many of you know. Uh, what is lesser known about Mr. Eastman is that, unfortunately, he did uh, take his own life at age 77. And what you see at the top of the slide is the note that he left. It said, to my friends, my work is done. Why wait? And to begin our talk, on suicide with Mr. Eastman's note because it it can reflect um, what what people generally think about late life suicide and what causes it, which is that people their life is done and finished and they they want the sense of autonomy to to end it. Um, at the same time, we we mention that because that's a, a, an overly simplistic view of late life suicide. And so, what we hope to show you today are the complex interacting factors that go on in that older adults want to take their life. Um, I place this in the context of uh, lots of psychological research that shows that on the whole, older adults do really well as they age, and most older adults are able to adapt to the stressors and losses in later life. Um, and unfortunately, some older adults are able to do that due to a, a constellation of factors we'll talk about. But um, so we want to keep all of that context text in mind because keeping all of that in mind will hopefully give us the best clues we can to prevention. So we'll move to the next slide, which is uh, just telling us that we're going to start with uh, prevalence of late-life suicide or, or how common this is among older adults. And move to the next one. Um, so as most of the people on this call, I'm sure, are aware of, um, older adults are the most rapidly growing segment of the population. What we have on the next slide is showing us basically a graphical depiction of the fact that we live in an aging world. Um, as life expectancy increases, the baby boomers age, our world, um, we're going to be an uh, increase in the number of older adults. And, uh, in the U.S., and by the year 2030, it's expected that over there'll be over 71 million older adults um, over age 60, and that will be 20% of our population. So, on. Um, so, like we said, that's a rapidly growing part of, this, of the population. At the same time, we know that older adults have higher rates of suicide than, than younger adults, really suggesting to us that there could be increased numbers of older adults moving forward who will unfortunately take their own lives. And next slide, what we're showing here is in the US, um, a bit more complicated than just saying older adults have higher rates. We need to look at more um, in-depth demographic factors to really understand uh, what's going on here. So what you see here are suicide rates. They're broken down by gender. And they're broken down by uh, race if the uh, people are white or black. And we see across the lifespan, which is on the x-axis, more men die than women across the lifespan. Um, also seeing, though, what's very striking is that blue area there that represents white men. And we see, again, across the lifespan, white men die at a much higher rate of suicide than in other portions of the population. And that's particularly true among the oldest old, so getting towards 85 and older. We'll go to the next slide. Um, make the point with this that it's not just in the U.S. that, that older men have a high rate of suicide. In most countries in the world, though not all, um, men do die at a dramatically higher rate than women. For the next, next one, um, a key part of epidemiology of late life suicide is just how lethal suicidal thoughts and behaviors are. What we mean by that is, is that we think about uh, different aspects of suicidal behavior, which are suicidal behavior 
in which we talk about our thoughts, suicidal attempts, and then by suicide. So thoughts and behaviors in older adults are more likely to result in death. Three that are that older adults on average are more frail, so more likely to die from suicide attempts. We know they tend to be isolated and therefore less likely to be rescued. And I, most importantly, for those of us working with older adults, they tend to be more planful and more determined in their suicidal behavior, more likely to use lethal means such as guns. And with that interaction of all of those factors, more likely for an older adult who is thinking about suicide to, to die uh, due to those thoughts. And the next slide is another sort of example of that. When we look at the left, what we're talking about are, is the general population. And you'll see for every adult who dies by suicide, there are quite a few hospitalizations for suicide ideation and behavior, quite a few emergency department visits. That, and that ratio shrinks dramatically for older adults. So an older adult, if they attempt suicide, must more likely to die on that attempt. And the next slide as well, we're looking at there are self-inflicted injury, meaning unlethal attempts. And what you see there, which is the opposite of the, the slides I was showing you before, is that more women are represented here. So more women are likely to attempt suicide across the lifespan. Uh, and what we're seeing as well is the sharp slope as we go across the age age group. Fewer your fewer suicide attempts, that is that more death. So that's a key part of the epidemiology of suicidal behaviors to keep in mind, that also are much more likely to die on their first attempt. The next slide is for example of, of why that might be the case. Um, you can see on the left, um, we're looking at the total population, we're looking at methods of suicide. And so the, the scheme part that I want you to look at is the proportion of people who use their arms, which is obviously a very lethal means of, of attempting suicide. And see, it's about 56% among the total population, whereas it, it leaps up about 73% among older adults. Okay, on the next slide, we're bringing all of this together. So this epidemiology is a um, we need to keep this study in mind and use it, a common I think, to inform that we intervene with older adults. And by that, is, is that bullet point there, interventions must be aggressive. So we need to do um, a lot. We need to put as much as we can out there to prevent these deaths. And uh, we need to do it earlier. So that's what the primary and secondary prevention, our key, is talking about. We'll show you in a little bit is an idea of the suicidal trajectory or those the, the time points leading up to someone's death. What we want to do with older adults is we don't want to wait until they're thinking about suicide necessarily. We want to um, intervene earlier. And what comes about that? That's what we're going to spend um, the next part of the talk talking about is what factors to target. So in the slide, we, what we have there is a, is a model of suicide suicidal behavior, and it says domains of suicide in later life. And to do is just go through each of those with some key, just some things to take away. And so what the overall model is telling us is that unlike um, the, the suicide note that Mr. East Eastman left for us, in fact, it's not that simple. Suicide deaths result from the intersection of many, many uh, factors and more than an older adult presents with greater risk they have. So if you see that, that diagram where all the overlapping circles are, um, the middle where they all overlap is where we expect an older adult to be at most risk. So next, let's start with um, the psychiatric uh, factors as, um, as, as an important factor to consider. And in particular, for older adults, there's, there's research showing that depression is is a particularly potent factor among older adults. I'll do that um, on the next slide. We, on the next slide are, are some uh, data from different studies examining psychiatric factors in late life suicide. The, the numbers that you're seeing there are odds ratios. A higher number is suggesting that old, an older adult was um, more likely to die by suicide um, if uh, one of these disorders was present.
And some of the different uh, studies had different comparison groups. So for the Harwood study, compared um, hospitalized older adults. So that's why the reason you might see the number vary a little bit. But really, the, the key thing to take away from this data that I'm showing up there is just um, risk increases with uh, disorders, and in particular, depression. So we're very, um, we're seeing very consistent results for mood disorders. And so we know that that is a very strong predictor among older adults, the presence of depression. Um, a key thing to, to point out is that although substance use disorders is the less common um, you know, among older adults, suicide, when it's present, it's very potent and it's, it's a potent factor. Um, it's just the calculus of the variance among older adults than it does in younger adults. Okay, that's important, but we'll go ahead and move to the next topic, which is looking at psychological factors, which also play a role. Because it's important to keep um, other factors in mind, because we know that all the vast majority of, of older adults who die of suicide had depression. The vast majority of older adults with depression will die by suicide. We may consider other factors that, in combination with depression, may lead an older adult to take his or her life. And so what I'll write for you on the next slide is, is one example of biological factors, in particular personality traits, that have been known to differentiate um, older adults who died by suicide from, from older adults who do not. And we know eroticism is a common factor. Um, so it might show up as anxiety or feeling angry, very self-conscious. Um, another one that seems particularly associated with, with older adult suicide, but not suicide among young younger adults, is the first trait: uh, low openness to experience. And so this tends to show up in terms of behaviors, or those things listed under the bullet there. So things like pre preferring familiar things, following a routine. And in terms of um, emotion regulation, it seems that people with low openness to experience or so blunted in their, their affective expression, so not expressing their emotions as much. And so there's definitely an area going forward that um, more research could be useful in terms of helping us understand exactly what is causing older adults to take their own life. And so we'll move on to the next domain of risk in, suicide, uh, in life, which is the biological domain. And so what we're considering there that there's um, there's a lot of research that I could I could spend the rest of my time talking about, which I'll uh, I want to, but there's a bunch of research um, that's examined biological correlates of, of suicidal behavior, so a really exciting field. Um, actually, though, the research hasn't gotten to the point where we have clinical applications for that research. We don't really have a way to, to harness the power of those studies in clinical work with older adults going forward that we'll want that research to consider is um, in relation with what we know about the complex interplay between the biological aging process and environmental changes as we age. Um, looking to the future, hopefully if we have another of these webinars in several years, we'll have an update for you to deal with with clinical applications. Um, in the meantime, we'll move to the next factor, which is um, domain of medical illnesses and, and treatment. Yeah, the next slide is an example of how this is a key domain among among older adults, and quite a bit of information on that slide, but I'll walk you through it. Um, the top of the slide um, has data from a study that examines just older adults, and they compared um, rates of physical illness among older adults um, who died by suicide compared to those with a motor vehicle accident. So the odds ratios that you see there are the odds of dying by suicide uh, compared to death via motor, motor vehicle accident. And the numbers are controlling for demographics and importantly controlling for depression. So we know that uh, many disorders are associated with, with increased risk for suicide, but often it's because those disorders are also associated with increased risk for depression. So in terms of helping us identify those older adults at greatest risk, we need to know but what are disorders that confer independent risk? Even depression is accounted for. And seeing in the, the top part of the slide is that cancer and prostate disease, not 
cancer, but uh, disease, and COPD for, for those who are married, had independent associations with suicide deaths above depression. And then we're seeing um, on the bottom is another study. They used match, living matched controls for this study. And again, what we're seeing are that several disorders have independent associations with suicide deaths above and beyond their contribution with depression. Being taken. And then an important part from that study, which I'll show you on the next slide, is that it's not just the type of physical illness that's important, but the number. And so what we're seeing here is that the number of illnesses an older adult was having to deal with, manage, and cope with, as they increased, so did risk for suicide. So keeping in mind that having multiple physical illnesses is a risk factor as well. We'll move on, kind of changing gears from, from medical factors to social factors. Now, Steve mentioned this is my um, area of interest, social disconnection, disconnect, but I'll spend just a little time on it. Um, what I'm showing you on the next slide is that there are quite a few indices of social disconnectedness. So feeling as if you aren't connected to other people. That shows up a lot of different ways in the suicide risk literature. And so we have older adults who reported family dis or feeling isolated, that increases risk for suicide, as well as uh, feeling like you don't have anyone to confide in, alone, or that um, you don't participate in community organizations or hobbies. And it's important to keep in mind, as we link this with what I just talked about with, with mental illness, that functional impairment and disability is also a key risk factor for older adults. And so, um, the way it might play out is that uh, functional impairments make older adults from being able to have the social interactions that they used to have and ability to drive and things such as that. Now, bereavement is a risk factor for late life suicide. But together, yeah, all of these factors suggest that less connected to other people an older adult is, the more likely they are to die by suicide. What I'll do is kind of put a whole constellation together. So if we imagine those circles and the overlap there, we're most worried about an older adult when they have many of these factors here. So the main domain being depression, a prior suicide attempt. And I know that's the part of the, the talk talking about the lethality of suicidal behavior in late, late life. But a prior suicide attempt when it is present is a potent predictor. And so keeping in mind this um, conversation, um, turn to Screening, how we might uh, then identify older adults with these risk factors who might be at risk for suicide. So on the next slide, uh, we turn to uh, prevention. I'm going to start with risk of then move to, to what to do with older adults we identify. So on the next slide, I told you I talked about the developmental process. And so um, I have a lot on this slide, but really, in short, what I want you to take away from it that we can think a trajectory towards suicide behavior across time. You add more risk factors and get closer and closer. Um, that changes the type of, of intervention that you're using. So um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and, and tell you about uh, briefly what a, an indicated intervention is, one that you might think of as, as treatment. So this is working with older adults who have suicide thoughts or have attempted suicide. Uh, and as you can see, that's part of the right. Towards the tra trajectory of dying by suicide. Okay. Talk about elective intervention, however. The idea with that intervention is that you're stepping backwards in this trajectory, identifying individuals before they have as many risk factors that have built up on the right. We're doing high, high risk groups. So, although not all members may bear may the risk, what we're doing is we're preventing suicide by, by reducing some of these risk factors. And then the bottom is universal, and we'll end with that, where you can target the whole population. One of the, the, the arguments that we, we have about is we can back up as much as we can with older adults. We, we make the most impact. Um, head to the next slide. And just so you'll have this, this is what we talked about. So I'll go ahead and skip it, but you'll have the information there. We'll start with um, what indicated prevention is. Again, this is working with high-risk individuals to prevent the, what the full-blown disorder in this case be, would be a suicide death. 
So when we're talking about indicated prevention, we're really talking as well about about screening. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, the, the with screening is that we need to identify who needs those indicated interventions and target them. So let's move to the next slide and talk about just why we would use a screening tool. And so it's very keep in mind that the goal of a suicide risk assessment or using a screening tool isn't predicting or not someone will die by suicide. Suicide, unfortunately, is a very low base rate event. It's very uh, very uncommon, and so it's it's possible for our screening tools to do a real job at identifying exactly who is going to die by suicide. For the most part, they'll they'll identify a greater pool of individuals than will die. So, what our goal instead? Our goal is to determine the most appropriate actions with those individuals that we need to to stay to keep focusing on any suicidal thoughts. And finally, keep in mind that. that we want to take action for any endorsement of suicidal ideations, but necessarily the same action for every level of risk. So we'll move to the next slide. And um, just a couple points here about how to do this. So it's important for us all to be on the same page with the idea that suicide risk screening doesn't cause someone to have suicidal thoughts. So research from um, um, Google that Kulam and others have shown that suicide screening is so not to worry that it'll put the idea in someone's head. Um, important to keep in mind that suicidal thoughts are a symptom of depression. Um, but as we've talked about, um, current adults without depression. So depression is a strong risk factor, but it doesn't mean if someone doesn't report depression that they may not be at risk. Um, we take them seriously, um, even though it does not mean that someone may actually die by suicide. Um, Keep in mind as well as for the next slide is that we think about suicidal thoughts um, in terms of being uh, severity. So um, we can think of them in terms of passive ideation, which would be things like thoughts that you'd be better off dead, which is what you see here in the PHQ 9, the last question. And we think of active suicidal ideation as being thoughts of, of actively taking one's own life. And that's these with various scales. What we have here is the PHQ-9. We have that with things like the geriatric depression scale and other tools. I, I picked this one because I think it was some that some of you will be using. And it's the one you use, what Dr. Conwell and I use with uh, the community groups that we work with here. And PHQ-9 basically just has nine symptoms of depression. And it talks about suicide risk 